Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Systematic Literature Review, How to Empower Data-Driven Decision-Making. Um, our webinar this morning, we will have um, two presenters, Lori Mitchell from Criterion Edge and Jennifer Tetzloff from Evidence Partners. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them now. Lori Mitchell is the founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing and safety services firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety, and pharmacovigilance management and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory solutions to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, she is a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. Jennifer Tetzloff is an experienced healthcare research professional whose work is focused on systematic review, conduct, and transparency. She was a member of the core team for the internationally develop, developed PRISMA statement, a reporting guideline for systematic reviews of healthcare interventions. In her current role as research product specialist at Evidence Partners, Jennifer works with her peers in the research community to develop and promote software-enabled best practices for scalable systematic review production. Jennifer holds a master's degree in epidemiology. So the first thing we want to look at is who's attending our webinar today. So we're happy to have you. Um, we created a word cloud uh, with the titles of our attendees. And so we can see some major themes here um, that we have clinical, um, regulatory and medical professionals, writers, consultants, specialists, managers. So we have quite a bit of uh, variation, but some major themes. We also asked you a couple questions um, when you were registering for the webinar, and we thought we'd report the results to you here. Um, so about 22% of you are not currently using systematic literature review, and about 78% are. So a lot of you have experience, which is probably interesting for the second question, which of the following is the biggest issue in your systematic literature reviews? And um, we had a few big ones. The, the biggest one was effective search strategy. And uh, Lori uh, will be talking about that shortly, uh, followed by adequate training and expertise, and then adhering to a rigorous process, which Jennifer will talk about how um, software can help you um, develop and adhere to rigorous processes. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Lori Mitchell, our first speaker, and she'll take you through the common challenges. Lori? Thank you, Mark, and hi, everyone. Welcome to this presentation on how systematic literature review can empower data-driven decision-making. We hope this webinar will present you with practical guidance on how to conduct a methodologically sound systematic literature review, insights into how the data can be used to support organizational decision making, and available technology and tools to help support the process. Performing systematic literature reviews can present multiple challenges to a team. For example, is there access to the right expertise, such as medical librarian services? to consult with and design a sound search strategy? Are regulatory compliant processes in place that support robust literature search, screening, and selection activities? And lastly, even with all of the above, executing the steps of a systematic literature review requires people. Even with tools and technology, there's no way to remove trained human eyes and brains from the process. The screening, review, and selection steps take time and people, both of which may be in short supply within a company. Bottom line is that maintaining consistency and increasing efficiency is difficult when there is a lack of available resources, or the steps are ill-defined, or manual processes are used that are slow and prone to error. In today's regulatory landscape, adopting a transparent, Reduce, reproducible process for literature reviews is essential. The objective of our session today is to review currently accepted SLR practices and provide guidance for designing and conducting a rigorous literature review 
from search strategies through screening, data extraction, and reporting. You'll notice that the term SLR is used here. It will be used interchangeably with systematic literature review throughout the presentation. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will know how leveraging published data can help meet regulatory expectations and inform internal decision making, why SLR is superior to simple internet searches, steps for conducting a methodologically sound SLR, and how to use available software and tools to support the process. Let's start with a description of the framework of an SLR and also examine how an internet search is much different from the systematic literature review process. A systematic literature review is a clear and methodologically sound plan for the identification, retrieval, selection, appraisal, and weighting of published data. This definition is taken from the 2009 article by Maurer et al. in which the authors described the PRISMA statement, which is a reporting structure for systematic literature reviews and meta-analyses. Systematic review methodology is nothing new. It has long been the gold standard process for evidence-based research, especially in the academic and professional arenas. The data derived from this method of comprehensive literature review has been used, for example, to develop clinical practice guidelines and recommendations and describe and support academic-based research initiatives, among other applications. Those same rigorous principles are now being mandated by global regulatory authorities and have been adopted by pharmaceutical and medical device manufacturers as best practice. Here's a bird's eye view of the basic steps of every SLR. Develop and define the research question or questions that are under investigation. Design the search strategy and conduct the search using all relevant literature databases. Screen all literature references returned from the search by applying predetermined exclusion and screening criteria to define the selection process. Extract relevant data from those included full text articles, and finally, synthesize, organize, and analyze the extracted data to answer the research questions. Next, we'll look at each of these steps in more detail. But first, let's establish the key differences between an internet search and a systematic literature review, because they're certainly not equivalent to each other. This graphic presents a high, uh, the high-level differences between the two types of searches. Internet searches should be considered ad hoc because they do not follow a predetermined plan methodology as a systematic literature search does. To begin, first, can the search results be considered comprehensive and thorough, extensively scoped across all relevant literature sources? The answer for an internet search is definitely no. The results are dependent upon the limited capability of internet search technology, the availability of published literature, and the relative skill of the searcher. However, the comprehensiveness of an SLR, SLR search is a definite yes, with a couple of caveats. It must be assumed that the search strategy was designed by a person knowledgeable in advanced search tech terminology and a robust software platform that supports advanced search capabilities was used. Can multiple literature databases be searched? No, not on the internet. Google, Google Scholar is not really considered a database, and PubMed is the only major literature database that can be accessed on the internet without a paid subscription. However, again, it is assumed that an SLR is run on a search platform with accesses to all, access to all relevant data. Yeah, the search platform supports flexible search terminology. No, the internet is not. Searches are dependent on keyword selection, or in the case of PubMed, only the AND search function is fully supported. To achieve comprehensive results, from a systematic literature search. The search strategy must use advanced mesh terminology and search 
search the intent. And this requires the use of complex such as ProQuest Dialog or Ovid, for example. Is the methodology clearly documented and reproducible, reliably yielding the same results each time? This is a definite no for an internet search. However, a well-documented SLR search strategy will produce the same search results again and again. Can objectivity in literature screening and selection be demonstrated? This character, characteristic, I'm sorry, character, characteristic, oh my gosh, characteristic relates not to the literature search, but to the criteria used in the literature screening and selection process. It is possible to apply the same rigor and level of documentation to the screening and selection of literature identified on the internet. However, if the search process itself is already questionable, it hardly matters if the screening and selection process of the literature is well described. The battle for objectivity is already lost, so to speak. Mark? Thanks. Next, we'll walk through a couple of case studies illustrating how the data derived from SLR activities can be leveraged to support critical regulatory questions or key corporate initiatives. Hey, Lori, this is Jessica. I'm just stepping in to let you know that your voice is really distinct. Manufacturer available data to address an organizational need or regulatory requirement. Some examples are to learn more about off-label usage, to support regulatory responses, to prepare a clinical evaluation report for MDR compliance, to develop white papers or other clinical marketing material, to gain insight into unknown hazards, to assess the current therapeutic landscape, or to inform recommendations for additional clinical or non-clinical analyses. This first case study involves a request from the medical affairs group of a large medical device manufacturer. The company was considering a design change to one of their endovascular stents and wanted to gather more real world data on current usage and procedural outcomes for their stents when compared to data on competitor stents of a different design. The search yielded over 200 articles, all of which were reviewed, and based upon the predetermined screening and exclusion criteria, 66 articles were ultimately included for data extraction. Multiple data points were extracted and analyzed on all stent designs included in the search. Those data points included the number of patients, demographic data, indication and type of procedure performed, procedural success, length of follow-up, and adverse events. The results and analysis were provided to the client for review and discussion with their management team. Based on the report findings, management agreed to move forward with a recommended design change for their stint. This next case study is an example of a systematic literature review being leveraged early in the clinical development phase of a unique device technology used in the treatment of colorectal cancer. The company wanted to conduct an extensive systematic literature review to identify relevant competitor evidence to support early evaluation of their device and contribute to the clinical development plan. Multiple review questions were established for three separate searches. Data related to current treatment options, disease burden, and risk were extracted from the screen search results. The extracted data were compiled and analyzed to address the review questions. And the result was the clinical development plan was updated to reflect additional information gleaned from SLR data. Now we'll delve more into the details of each step of the SLR process. First is the 
to define the research question, which is really a key step in the overall scoping of the SLR process. You should identify the purpose of the search. Basically, what do you need to know? Then establish clear research questions that will guide that purpose. Determine where to search by identifying relevant databases such as Embase, Medline, SciSearch, and others. And ask yourself, will other sources of data be considered such as unpublished literature? These well-defined search questions provide the foundation for the entire literature review process. It is essential to ensure that the search questions are clear, that the literature search planning process is thorough, and the search strategy is well documented. Key takeaways for this scoping process are, take the time to determine clear research questions and document your process for transparency and reproducibility. Consider developing a literature search scoping worksheet to guide and to document the process. This is a really handy, um, this is a really handy worksheet that we've developed and we find it to be um, a great tool. Next slide. Using the framework from the scoping exercise, the next step is to design and run the literature search. Identify key search parameters such as relevant search terms, for example, product names, PICO terms, patient population indications, other keywords. Determine exclusion criteria for article selection like, for example, foreign language or animal studies. Will you exclude those? Establish search limits such as the time range of the search and study type or levels of evidence to be included or, or excluded. For example, will you exclude abstracts and conference proceedings? A couple of key takeaways at this step are use a librarian with experience designing medical information search strategies such as these and maintain a record of all literature returned by the search. This is very critical. This documents that all potentially relevant articles were considered for inclusion. This is where my part of the presentation ends. To take it from here, I would like to introduce my co-presenter, Jennifer Tetzlaff from Evidence Partners. She will continue reviewing the steps of the SLR, focusing on screening, data extraction, and reporting. Jennifer? Thank you. Lori, can you confirm you see my screen? All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm just confirming you have access to my screen. Yeah, Jennifer, we see it. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so that was really informative, Lori. Thank you. I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, my role uh, today is twofold. Firstly, I'm going to build on what Lori has discussed and highlight some of the best practices for the remaining steps of your review. Secondly, I'm going to detail ways that software can help at each of these stages. So let's start with some of the challenges and best practices for screening. One defining feature for systematic literature reviews are, of course, robust methods to minimize bias. Study selection should be based on predefined criteria that are used consistently throughout the review process. And where possible, screening should be conducted by two independent reviewers if you have the resources for that. There's also artificial intelligence now that can support you as well. Now, transparency is very important. You should definitely be tracking your screening decisions to comply with uh, regulations. And lists of ex excluded studies and reasons for exclusion are common reporting requirements. Now, uh, as I'm not sure it's going to be a surprise to anybody, uh, the literature, the volume of literature is, is huge. Strategies to help manage this include using multi-stage process, because this can save time and money. So looking at your titles and abstracts first and moving on to full text uh, only for those that are deemed relevant. That's pretty intuitive. Uh, and then, of course, using automation wherever possible. And I've, I've put a few examples here. So now data extraction should also be prospectively planned and consistent. 
This, this generally includes, as Lori mentioned, PICO, which if you're not familiar with that acronym, that's po Population Interventions, Comparators and Outcomes. Uh, so that really defines your questions for your review, your search strategy, and of course, the data you want to extract. And then generally, you'll be extracting performance and safety data as well. The use of predefined uh, easy to use forms is advised because it results in cleaner data, you have greater efficiency, and I also want to mention that data extraction should be at the study level. So uh, software can allow you to link related publications and that, that really helps so you can avoid double counting data. Finally, when designing your methods for data extraction, it's really great to think ahead about your data reuse. If you develop standard methods, you're going to be able to leverage that data for future reviews and updates. Now, of course, not all evidence is equal and that's very important. Many, but not all types of systematic reviews will require an appraisal of the literature. Depending on your training, you might be more familiar with terms such as internal validity, risk of bias or quality assessment. And there are various accepted methods depending on who you're reporting to and the domain you're in. Either way, training and expertise is, is certainly required uh, to, to use the tools that are available. Logistically speaking, uh, this information should be collected with the same care that you do any other data and rationale for judgments should be recorded and it should be attributable, attributable back to the, the original reports as well. So that brings us to synthesis. Studies can be combined descriptively or quantitatively. Uh, Meta-analysis is certainly not uh, always required and it's very often not advised. You want to be considering sources of heterogeneity, heterogeneity such as uh, clinical differences, methodological differences, and of course, statistical differences between the studies when you're thinking about combining them or, or how you're going to even describe them narratively. You want to consider subgroups of importance. Maybe that's based on equity or settings. Uh, there, there may be different issues of subgroups depending on your review question. And many groups, but certainly not all, use a, an assessment of assessing the certainty of a body of evidence. So this is at an outcome level uh, and it's, it's used uh, very commonly in guideline assessment and, and in cert certain other healthcare realms. But I've included grade here as an example. There's, uh, I won't, I'm not gonna go into any more detail than that today, but there are, there's, there are gui there's guidance to help you with that process. So the last point here, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, engagement with methodologists or statisticians uh, for various parts of your synthesis is certainly encouraged. So before I discuss how software help can help, I'd like to just briefly touch on the importance of transparent reporting. We've talked about PRISMA. Uh, there's, there's evidence-based guidance in PRISMA for systematic literature reviews, and then there are also uh, adaptations for different types of reviews. Requirements will vary, of course, depending on where your report's being submitted, but typically will include the some of the bullets here, your search strategy and your output, a transparent description of your methods, of course, for screening and data extraction and synthesis, a clear summary of study data, data and uh, major journals will also re generally request a flow diagram, such as uh, the one that's that's listed here. So this shows the flow of studies through your review very clearly. As a rule of thumb, your report should be sufficiently detailed as to enable replication. So the importance of transparent reporting can't be overstated. So how can software help? As you can easily imagine, uh, software provides various efficiencies and automation compared to uh, standard manual methods. There are different types of software which can help your reviews. Many tools facilitate one or a few review processes for example, I'm sure many of you, uh, if you have given the experience with systematic literature reviews, that you're familiar with at least one reference management tool, such as EndNote, for example. Uh, there are also other task-specific tools that include those that can help you find some search terms, looking at linkages between search terms to help develop your search strategy. One, one particular tool is called Voyant. And then there are various tools that support analysis and reporting as well. So these tools are helpful for the targeted roles that they play in your review process. Systematic literature review software, on the other hand, is specifically designed to address many of these stages of, of research. It may include uh, any or all of the features you see here, and this is what we're gonna focus on today. 
So review software is designed to support your reviews throughout its entire life cycle. It allows you to automate many, many time consuming tasks and you can create uh, prescriptive processes so this that can maximize your data quality. Cloud-based tools allow you to interact with your team in real time, uh, and they will store all of your source material, your reviewer interaction, your data together, and it's all in a secure, auditable, and regulatory compliant platform. Some systematic literature review software can even share data bidirectionally with data repositories. So this is really uh, useful and important for future reuse of your coded data across projects. Now, there are many features with software uh, in terms of reference management that can provide efficiencies very easily to your review. Comprehensive systematic review software will incorporate an array, uh, evidence from an array, array of sources, and you can easily import uh, in main reference formats as well as bulk import of PDFs as well. Some software also has direct links with major database, databases such as PubMed. So you can then actually conduct your search from directly within the software. It also will track the date and time of imports. Automation at this stage provides several advantages and I've included a couple here, but built-in deduplication within the software allows you to remove overlap across the sources that you're searching so you don't have to screen the same information twice, as well as there are options for automated full text retrieval. So these two features alone can translate into a substantial time savings for your team. Now, generally working in uh, software, a comprehensive a systematic, review so systematic literature to use software, uh, will be collecting your data through forms. I've, I've given one example here, but they're electronic forms. Basically, as you can see, you're prevented, presented with bibliographic information. If they were PDFs, you'd have one-click access to them as well. And you're presented with questions. In this case, these are very specific to the one project. And you... <sighs> Sorry, um, but you can, these are customizable to your needs. So project by project, level by level, these forms, we, you would design them to be based on your review project. To screen or extract, you need only to review the information, you answer the question, select submit, and you're taken to the next record, do the same and so on. So it's very intuitive. The ability to automate, um, sorry, to collaborate in real time for screening and data extraction, as numerous efficiencies as well. Tools with automated tracking will record who made what entry and when, and the software is triaging records through the review while you're screening. So it's tracking your reasons for exclusion as well. It will also flag conflicts between, between reviewers if you've been able to do a review, and all of this is done automatically. I'd also like to mention that if you're using a tool with version control and audit logs, this ensures that if you make changes or anybody makes changes to your data, you know who made the changes and when, and all previous versions are preserved. So this is important for regulatory compliance. I've mentioned about, uh, I, I've referred to artificial intelligence briefly. This can help you in a number of ways and, and this the, the functionality is increasing all the time. But at this time, it can help you identify records, your relevant studies sooner by prioritizing them. Uh, and then it can also, it's going to be, it's, it can also help with study classification. Now the best tools are those that are flexible to meet your needs because this will result in a more efficient and cleaner, a more efficient process and cleaner data. I'm sorry, just trying to, there we are. Data and project management is not present in every tool, but it is uh, incredibly important and incredibly useful. So a comprehensive tool will allow you to easily store, access, save, and report your data in many formats that you need for your specific analysis and reporting. Some software will also off, op, offer options to create prefabricated reports, and I've included a few examples here, where you can have one-click access to exclusion reports, Prisma flow diagrams, you have uh, many options for project oversight. So you have real-time visibility into what's happening with your team. And this is useful on a single project basis. It's also useful if you're managing hundreds of projects. Finally, you have control 
in, in certain software, you have control, uh, a granular permission settings so that you can provide access to your team, only what they need to see, and they can easily access their tasks. So this is important for efficiency and data integrity. Technology in this field is, as I said, rapidly advancing, and we're beginning to see this new reality of living reviews. Re living reviews are reviews which are continually updated as evidence becomes available. Advances in technology and software are going to continue to improve and support these processes. So some of the key points that I covered today and that Lori covered is that are that your, your, your review should have simple processes. They should be repeatable to help reduce bias at each stage. Your methodology should be transparent. It should be reproducible. You should maintain strict quality control and data management practices. Additionally, when you're planning your review, take time, give mind to processes that can facilitate future updates and data reuse. So in line with these, here are some five pragmatic best practices for reviews. Optimize your screening and data extraction processes. If you have similar processes between uh, across reviews, uh, using software can enable that to be very streamlined. Use uh, audit, use software, if you're using software, use audit trails and version control. Enforce prescriptive processes wherever you can for cleaner data. Consider creating living reviews so that you can stay up to date on portfolios that you manage. And finally, data repositories will allow you to leverage the work that you've already done. So before I pass this back to Mark, I just want to give a quick three points of what I hope that we were able to convey today. And that's firstly that systematic literature reviews are really defined by pre-specified and consistent methodology. There are variations of that, but that's, that's the general case. Your teams need adequate expertise. If you don't have this in-house, you can uh, look to service providers. Obviously a good example is Criterion Edge. We're here today. Uh, consider ways that they can help your, your, your process. And finally, efficiency doesn't need to come at the expense of validity. And this is where a systematic review software can help. So I'll pass that back to Mark, if that's all right. And thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer, as well as Lori for that great knowledge. Now we're going to Go ahead and head into the conclusion. So in today's uh, session, we're hoping that you've learned and understand how to, how to use published data to meet regulatory expectations and inform internal decision making, why SLR is superior to simple internet search, um, steps for conducting a methodologically sound SLR, and how to use software tools to support your SLR. So if you don't understand those points or any any other ones, we urge you to put questions into the question box on your screen, and we'll go ahead and answer those starting now. And we have a few to start out with. Um, so I'm just going to um, hand out the questions, and Lori and Jennifer, you can answer the ones um, as you see appropriate. So the first one is um, uh, straightforward. Why do I need this? I know how to do a search on Google Scholar. Isn't that enough? Lori and Jennifer? Jennifer, do you want to take that? <laughs> well, I, I, I certainly can. <laughs> I think I think you addressed that very well. So I think I'd be repeating some of the points that that you said, Lori. And Google Scholar it may be a great resource. Uh, I haven't used that particularly in my systematic reviews. I do know that it's used as a supplementary method for with many of the uh, the experts that I've consulted with. It does not have traceability. You can type in a certain keywords uh, or search mm -hmm. words one day and type it in the next day and you will not necessarily return the same literature. So that's, that's important. When we're talking about the systematic literature review best practices, you should be able to trace where the information came from. You should be able to trace where it's gone through the process as well. Thanks, Excellent. Jennifer. And I, I, I threw that to you too because I, I understood in our chat bar that my sound cut out during the webinar. So my apologies uh, for that little bobble in the middle of all that. And I didn't want to jump in and answer the question before I checked it 
people could hear me. So thanks, Jennifer, for um, picking up that. Um, uh, Mark, do you have another question? Yeah, sure. We just got one. Um, when is a meta-analysis of outcome data appropriate and when is it not? I, I should probably take that one. <laughs> sure. Uh, unless unless you, you would like to, Lori. I, 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 I might have something to add, but you first. Yes, please do. I think uh, I'll start. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, had the great advantage of having access to statistical uh, expertise in the group that I worked in. Everybody brought different things to the table. So you want to be looking for studies that are similar, generally. You want to be looking for similar populations and uh, similar inter interventions, time points, uh, outcome definitions. Meta-analysis is, is generally more appropriate when you're working with homogeneous data. data. There are many other factors to consider that come down to the statistics of it as well. And in terms of transformations that might have to be made with the data, I won't speak to that right now, but uh, those are those are the main issues. For for my point of view, um, I did hear the the homogeneity of the the data set. I think is important, um, or uh, if it's pool data across, say, for example, in the medical device world, if you are looking at um, uh, outcome safety and performance outcome data from competitor devices, a pool of competitor devices, then as long as that, as long as the data set and the data outcomes and data points are, are um, established and are consistent across all sources of data, in other words, different competitor devices, I think that you can conduct a rigorous um, analysis of that data. I'm not sure when data and meta-analysis would ever be inappropriate other than not possible um, with, with in as you said Jennifer when the data set is not homogeneous uh, when you have uh, and, and you cannot compare data across the elements so that would be my add-on to that Excellent. Um, before I won't go on to the next question, I just want to note, because there's some questions coming in about this, that we are recording this webinar, um, and we'll be sending out the recording as well as a slide deck in the next day or so that you'll be able to view it again and share it. Um, so with that, we have another question. Uh, in my experience, the exact same search strategy in the same database does not always give the same 100% results when conducted on separate occasions, about 90% reproducible. How is this possible? Jennifer, do you have thoughts on that? I, I don't. I actually find that a very interesting comment. Do you? Um, I, I do too find it interesting. I would, I would venture guesses that it may have something to do with uh, the availability of the published data um, that on one day perhaps something wasn't available to be published and or it wasn't released or it was in draft form and another day other uh, other uh, it was available I would yeah. imagine too that if it's a very focused search um, maybe that 90% would be higher because you're not casting your net very very widely but if it was a large search very um, a very very large search that returned a higher number of hits, I would wonder about uh, that it's just the the in number of citations that are returned then reveals more inconsistencies. Those are my best guesses. Absolutely. The, the other thing too, and the other thing too is that um, I think from a regulatory standpoint to or if we're we're talking about regulatory consistency, um, I think there is a margin of error. I think I'm, I'm glad the the uh, attendee asked this question because I think there is a reasonable margin of error um, built into even the most rigorous process. In the um, I, my my thought is that perhaps there's not a date date specific search here. It's about the strategy, but it's not about the date. If the panelist feels like they would like to elaborate, that's fine. Uh, but absolutely, that would make sense then if it's an issue of uh, of more more literature being indexed 
uh, between the two times if it was not limited by date. Excellent. Uh, so no question is when do regulators request SLR data? I can take that one if you like, Jennifer. Perfect. Hmm. Um, in our experience as a regulatory and medical writing company, and we conduct uh, systematic literature reviews for many, many, many of our clients, um, we have, and kind of thinking back on the slide that I um, that I presented about all the different times in which case studies, I mean case studies and that one slide, we've done systematic literature reviews for clinical marketing uh, to put together um, materials to take out to their KOLs or to understand more about um, uh, best practices or usage of their device in the marketplace. Uh, from a regulatory standpoint, I think I'll get to your question with regards to when do regula regulators request SLR data. Um, certainly in this in the medical device world, which I can speak to, uh, that is this is certainly born through in the clinical evaluation reports that are now being required by the EU uh, MDR uh, new regulations that are coming. Uh, which many of you, if you're in the medical device world, will know about. And even if you're not, you've probably heard about. Uh, and those then, uh, those regulations are then uh, transferring over into the IVD space in a couple of years uh, after that. So systematic literature review uh, is, is often asked for by regulators if the data is used to make decisions or to um, direct therapy or um, indications for a, a device or a drug? I, I would say that's another answer. Excellent. Um, we have another one. Can literature searches be made easier? I never have enough resources to do this. <laughs> well, I, I, will, I will jump in and say that um, our friends at Evidence Partners make a great tool in Distiller SR, mm -hmm. and it's. I, I think Jennifer, you made an important point that um, that even with tools, the tools like Distiller and other tools that are at our disposal, um, the, it makes the job easier and certainly makes it more efficient. I, I would use the word efficiencies um, and uh, less prone to manual error. When you use manual processes, uh, Excel spreadsheets, for example, to conduct your uh, screening in, that's possible. You can do that, but those are not very auditable and they are very prone. We all know that uh, manual processes equal potential errors. And uh, with a tool like Distiller SR, we've found it, we've been using it for a number of years and we find it to be um, very efficient and traceable and our clients are happy with it because if they have a distiller license, but even if we're doing the searches and screening in our distiller, we can clone that project over to their distiller license and they have full visibility into the process, which is a cool feature of distiller. Great, we have a, a more specific question now. Um, a manufacturer of a medical device with no predicate devices and very niche technology, and as such, not much literature available, would SLR still be beneficial considering that searches will not deliver too much literature? This is Lori, I'll, I'll take that. Um, and, and first of all, I would say wh whoever asked that question would be happy to talk to you offline more about that because you've touched upon a a very specific question that is very difficult, can be very tricky to navigate. Um, I assume we're probably talking about a clinical evaluation report or something like it. And my answer to the question is, would SLR be beneficial? I would say an SLR is essential. Uh, you're, you, from a regulatory standpoint, from the notified body standpoint, they're going to require that they see due diligence in a very methodologically sound literature search strategy and all of the steps within a CER 
to document that what you went and looked for and what you found or and in this case what you didn't find but there are other strategies that we can take from more of the evaluation of the device itself such as uh, we often use procedural success as a as a way to document uh, safety and performance for example and again I don't want to get too wonky into that but I love talking about stuff like that and if the um, attendee would like to um, uh, contact me. My um, email is on the on the slide, on the back slide. Excellent. Yeah, I want it. We're about 45 minutes into the webinar, and we have quite a few more questions. So we will continue taking questions. But if you have to depart again, you'll receive the recording as well as the slides in the coming day. Uh, and Lori, as well as Jennifer's contact information, is on the slide. I'm sure either of them would be happy to talk to you if you feel like you want to address a question to them just individually. Our next question is uh, probably for Jennifer. How can artificial intelligence be employed currently in reviews? I know you touched on that in the presentation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, it's, I feel as though it's actually changing daily uh, for the better. That's the exposure I get here at Evidence Centers. But uh, in terms of applicability right now, do you have an echo? I do hear an echo on my end. Okay. Um, in terms of use at this time, artificial intelligence can be used to uh, prioritize your references. So essentially, reviewers will go into their review, they will screen a portion of records, and then they will train AI classifiers to then predict the relevance of the rest of the records. So that, that essentially just assigns a score of some degree to the rest of the records, and it can be used in many ways. So it can be used, again, to prioritize references, so it's just bubbling up your relevant references so you can get to them sooner, so that they can get to the next stages of re your review quicker, you, that you can then triage the way you work with your team. You may have some um, maybe perhaps junior reviewers that are doing more of that screening after that, where your, your more experienced reviewers can be working with the included studies sooner. It also helps with, with your analysis. Knowing what you're working with sooner can help develop that plan. Artificial intelligence can also be used as a post-review audit. That's very, uh, no risk. Uh, basically, you run it against your, your, your screening results and it tells you if there's anything that looks like one of your included studies and it can be used as its own reviewer as well so you can use that as a secondary reviewer you it's not recommended to use it as a primary reviewer uh, you could use it as a third reviewer if you wanted as well but it's one of the uh, really interesting parts uh, of having it integrated into software uh, in the realm that i've been able to use it and test it is you can it, it treats it in, entirely as a reviewer. You can go into uh, what in this case it's called Datarama, but the area that you work with your data, you can see uh, perhaps my screening decisions and you can see the AI screening de decisions. You can run Kappa scores against them. You can uh, do conflict checks. It's, it's, it's visible and it's available to you and you can use it if you choose to. Excellent. Uh, I think this one's probably for Lori. Lori, sometimes I end up with hundreds of articles. Most of them are not relevant. How can I focus my search strategy? The best way to focus a search strategy is to be very specific up there in that scoping um, step. Uh, spend the time that it takes to zero in on the data that, that you're looking for, the endpoints, the safety and performance endpoints, for example, or safety and efficacy endpoints that you're looking for, the data that you need, what is, what is important and what you want to be able to filter out through limits in the search. Really talk through those steps. Um, what you decide then uh, will, will really inform and focus your results from the search. Additionally, uh, a good medical librarian, a good medical librarian can write that mesh terminology and that, that syntax in such a way as that they come out with focused results. Uh, we have a, a client, I'll just tell you a story. We have a client that came to us asking us to do a systematic literature review because they were on um, PubMed 
on the internet, and they PubMed really only um, supports the AND uh, uh, syntax and search uh, command. And um, they were they came back with literally 4,500 um, articles that came back uh, from one search. When we ran it through with our librarian and on our platform, ProQuest Dialog, um, that 4,500 went down to uh, less than 900. And that wasn't because it filtered things out. It was because that there were many, many hundreds of false hits. So, so a, a good strategist, an experienced librarian, and uh, it really goes a long way to winnowing down and getting rid of the um, the duplicates and the um, the non-focused, irrelevant returns. Excellent. Here's uh, a specific question, probably for Lori. Does SLR have to be performed prior to CER? SLR uh, systematic literature review is a cornerstone and a foundational exercise that needs to be uh, that needs to be conducted in order to gather clinical literature or clinical data on your the device under or devices under evaluation um, in our experience when we write uh, CERs we conduct two uh, searches uh, sometimes more but two types of searches we conduct a search for the to support the um, the state-of-the-art section and that is a kind of a, a combination of a PICO search and a competitor device search where you're actually looking for data. So the way I sometimes say it is, is that you need to conduct a systematic literature research with sound methodology, rigorous practices documented if you're collecting data, data. If you're just looking for information to inform, say, inform, say the clinical condition or the epidemiology or all the other parts of the state of the art that are not um, data driven, that that you can do. It, th those are gray literature searches. Those are ad hoc internet searches. That part that part doesn't matter because that's information. But when you're collecting, looking for, and collecting and extracting data in order to make an argument or to establish the state of the art of your device, that needs to be a, a rigorous, transparent, methodologically sound process. Excellent, here's another specific one. We like to have at least two reviewers for the initial inclusion exclusion process or abstract review. How many reviewers do you recommend for the full text review? I can comment, and Lori, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well, because yeah. I'm different in different spaces, because there are different resources avail available. Yeah. <laughs> Some people can only do uh, a single review, and, and that's all there is to it. Uh, I have been looking at substantial data lately, uh, trying to understand uh, human error in screening, and also mm -hmm. looking directly at reviewers who have worked with our product, because you because it's all auditable. Um, I'm collaborating with some teams. Basically, all the data is private in Distiller, but this team uh, at a at an academic institution, well, the Mayo Clinic, we've been collaborating and looking back at their data for many of their reviews. So these are experienced researchers and they are making exclusion errors. They, they do everything in duplicates, so, uh, but we can, we can look and see what if one reviewer had been working on their own, what they would have missed. So my recommendation in answer to that question, uh, I would always, as a theory, <laughs> recommend that you're doing duplicate screening. That said, there are cases where that's not possible, and perhaps that's where you'd like to look into the option of artificial intelligence to make, uh, to have your second screener that way. I think that's an, <clears throat> that's an excellent point, and I would only add that uh, and kind of build on the pragmatic part of um, duplicate screeners across all levels of screening, both on abstract level and at the full text article screen level. Um, we have a team of 
of um, reviewers and they back each other up at the abstract level and we'll find there will be there will always be conflicts and then those conflicts can be you know one person said exclude one person said include and then we often have a they either get together themselves when they see those conflicts in distiller and then decide on a on a resolution or uh, it goes up the food chain to for somebody else to make a decision. Uh, it's it is it becomes a little bit more pragmatically tough uh, and logistically tough to do full text article review uh, twice. Uh, this is a bandwidth issue even for us. It's a time issue and it's a cost issue at the end of the day. It, it takes time. As I said earlier, it takes human eyeballs. <laughs> And it, used, it takes human brains, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. And distiller is very cool too because it tracks how much time each reviewer is spending on a at each at each screening level and at each decision on each citation. So we can even see that those metrics and and try to improve or um, loop back on with people if their uh, their metrics are different than the rest of their team. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We have a few more minutes. I know some of you are uh, dropping off, but those of you who have stuck with us, uh, we'll try to get your questions answered. Um, one we have here, can you explain why report data is not equal to study data? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I, I'll take that, Laurie, if that's all right. <laughs> Great. So any study uh, can be very, very, well, very often, I won't say frequently, but uh, often studies will be uh, published in more than one report, whether it's initial uh, study results, long-term follow-up, or it's parsing out the data for different subgroups, whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of times it has to do with the same participants, but it's being reported in multiple ways. Now that should be theoretically easy to find, but it's actually not. Sometimes it's, it's, it's hidden, it's different authors. If it's large database work, for example, uh, it, it's not always easy to know when you're working with actually the same study. So that's part of it. The other part of it is that uh, you can also have multiple studies in one report. I've seen that uh, quite a few times. So the point is just to be extracting your data based on the study, not the report. It will make things much more fluid. If you are using a system that can link the reports through your screening and your data extraction, you can be looking at any document that's related to that specific study that you found and, and be doing your extraction at the same time. Yeah, that question really gets to the heart of the primary source of data. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, we have a time for a couple more, hopefully. Um, this one, among the article appraisal tools available, how would I know which is the best to use? <laughs> I can jump in if you'd like, Jennifer, on that. <laughs> I have an opinion. <laughs> um, in our world, uh, uh, we are we are very um, uh, tied to and enjoy using the uh, Global Harmonization Task Force (GHTF) um, uh, weighting. And well, that would be appraisal data uh, weighting uh, with regards to level of evidence. That is, uh, we we use that um, that validated tool as well. But that can be described. For example, in a CER, if you can go out and find levels one, two, three, and four levels of evidence, uh, and you can alter that, you can alter those choices. Um, as long as you publish it in the, in the CER, I'll take, again, I'll pick on a CER as an example for levels of evidence. Uh, you can, as long as you describe but what level one is, level two, level three, uh, you're, you're fine with that. With regards to appraisal, however, the GHTF is a great tool to use. I highly recommend it. It looks a little busy and complex, but once you get used to it, it's very, very informative. And in fact, it's called out in um, uh, MedDevRev 4, I think, as a preferred. Well, I don't, they don't. They don't go as far as to say it's preferred. They suggest it as a possible tool. So that's what we use. And I will just add that. Uh... Having had the privilege to work with some of the leaders in the field, at least in the academic space, uh, they, you know, have worked 
many years to develop their own tools. And I think the bottom line that I have seen come out of it is uh, to not try and assign scores, to try and look at the domains of interest, be able to justify decisions that you've made, it, keeping it transparent, making it um, a prospective process that, you've, that you're applying consistently, as I said. I think that's what's most important. Ultimately, these will come down to judgment, and it's a matter of being transparent in that judgment. Excellent. With that, we've reached our time. Uh, I want to thank you both, Jennifer and Lori, for uh, sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. And thank you, attendees, for sticking with us. Hopefully, um, we've provided uh, the information you need. If not, again, feel free to reach out to our presenters. Um, as you see on your screen today, you will be getting a copy of the recording of this webinar, as well as the presentation in the next day. And I want to thank everyone for attending. With that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.